Well, there was a young man who became a father. And he was so excited to have a son. And he was thinking about all the things that he could teach his son. And he decided to write a journal. A journal that he would write down advice in and later could give it to his son. So he wrote about things like how to deal with problems, how to do things right, how to live well. But after about 10 years, he started facing some hard times. Things didn't turn out how he had expected them to. And he was discouraged. And he became, this father became disillusioned. And he decided to stop writing. But he made one last entry. He wrote, disregard all I wrote. It doesn't work. That's a very sad situation. Can you imagine reading that as the son? You're reading through all these things and finally you get to the end. Disregard. And you would say, what? What do I do with this now? Well, we've been studying through the book of James. And he has given us a lot of very practical advice. And now we come to the end of the letter. And James doesn't leave us with any uncertainty. Uh, he actually does the opposite of that. He says, it works. Faith works. And he challenges us at the end to live it out. Let's think back to the things that James has told us. Through his letter, he has told us several things. He told us how to deal with suffering and how when we face suffering, it actually is used. God uses that to grow us and make us more like Jesus, to grow our faith. He talked about temptation and sin and how we should obey God and not yield to that temptation. Uh, but when we do, it's because of our desires raising up within us. He told us that we should uh, trust um, God. Our trust should be in God, and God is good. He is worthy of that trust, and He can do all that He has promised to do. He's told us to be doers of the Word, and not just hearers only. So not people who just read it and then walk away and forget it, but who read it and then do what it says. We live it out. He talked about, uh, he said that we, there should be no prejudice among us, but that we should love others. He said that living by faith produces works in the life of the person of faith. He told us to watch our mouths and be godly with our words. He told us don't be selfish and don't fight amongst each other. And it is our selfishness that causes quarrels and arguments and fights. He told us uh, that if we need wisdom, ask God. And he gives it freely. He told us to draw near to God. And said that God will draw near to us. He said, don't be arrogant. Don't think that your life is all within your control and all in your hands. It ultimately depends on God. And he said, life is more about wealth. Excuse me. Life is about more than wealth and what we can gain here and now. But we should live in view of eternity. And he said other things. This letter is just jam-packed with very practical life issues and instructions and direction for life. And sometimes he just got right in our faces and was very direct. And said, do what is right. Well, now we come to the end of the letter. And at the end, he gives us this final challenge with three important instructions for living this life of faith. So verse 12, he says, But 
above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Now, this last part of the letter starts with the words, but above all, which makes it sound like maybe this thing that he's saying right here is the most important thing he could say. But I don't think that's what he means by this, especially when we consider all of the things that he has taught us through this letter. But this is actually, it's another transition statement. We've, we've talked about his transition statements. He makes quite a few of them. But it's a transition statement, and it definitely does draw attention to these final instructions. But this transition state, statement is marking the beginning of his closing challenge. Kind of like saying, and finally, and saying, listen to this. Not, okay, in conclusion, that means you can wrap everything up, stop listening, and, but finally, listen to this. And so he starts by saying, do not swear. And when he says swear, he's not talking about using vulgar language, but he's talking about taking oaths, swearing to the truthfulness of a statement. And when, in, in this, he, he doesn't seem to be speaking in reference to official or legal oaths, you know, like when you're making a commitment, like in an oath of office or an oath of service or uh, in, in a courtroom. Rather, he's talking about swearing in regular, everyday life. You know, like when people say, tell you something and say, I swear, or even I swear to God. Now, why do people say that? Why do people use those words, add those words when they make a statement? I swear or I swear to God. Well, they do it to bolster their argument, to try and prove their point. It's used to reinforce the truthfulness of what they're saying. And in James's time, people did this a lot. People would swear oaths for the same reason. And sometimes they would swear by God. In other words, the suggestion is, if I'm not telling the truth, then may God strike me down. Which was a dangerous thing to do if you weren't telling the truth. But that's what they were doing. And so the problem was here is that a liar can swear falsely. So I make a statement that's not true and then just say, and I swear. They're saying that to bolster the argument, but it may just be trying to convince you of something that's not true. Well, so James comes along and says, well, don't do that. Jesus talked about this too. In Matthew 5, verses 33, 30, 33 to 37, Jesus said, again, you have heard that it was said of those of old. To those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform form to the Lord what you have sworn. In other words, if you made an oath, you better keep it. And he continued on, but I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is the footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say simply be yes or no, anything more than this comes from evil. And so the fact that swearing falsely is wrong and invites judgment is emphasized here. But both James and Jesus say, don't use oaths. The reason why? It shouldn't be necessary. They say, just say yes or no. And this is his point. Just tell the truth. Be honest. Tell the truth. You don't need to bolster your argument. Just tell the truth. See, if you have integrity and if you are honest, then you are trustworthy and you're, you can simply answer with yes or no. Just be honest. But it's amazing just how easily people lie. People lie all the time and don't think anything of it. But that's sin. It's, a not, it's not godly. It's not a godly use of our words. So we can be reminded again, watch your mouth. Watch your mouth. 
Don't lie. That's not the life of faith. So be honest and tell the truth. Well, now we come to the second instruction of James's conclusion. And it's the longest of the three. And it's an absolutely necessary part of living the life of faith. And that is that we need to pray. Now, this entire paragraph of verses 13 to 18 is about prayer. It's about talking to God. In fact, the word pray or prayer or both of them appear in every verse. So let's begin in verse 13. He says, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. So he starts here with these two rhetorical questions, and then he answers uh, what we should do in those situations. So first of all, is anyone suffering? Now, do you remember the very beginning of his letter? The very first thing that James talked about. Do you remember what it was? Suffering. So he's going all the way back to the beginning now and saying, are you, so are you suffering? Then pray. And, and so he talked about that. He talked about enduring through suffering. And so now as he closes, he reminds us of that and tells us how we can endure through that suffering. He says, if you're suffering, if you're going through hardship, then pray. Talk to God. Ask Him for strength. Ask Him for help. And then he continues with the second question. Is anyone cheerful? Now, being cheerful is not necessarily the opposite of suffering. Because you could be cheerful while you are suffering. He talked about that earlier. Remember, he said, consider it or count it all what? Joy. When you endure various trials. When you suffer. Because you know that it's going to bring about growth in your faith. So he says, you can be cheerful. You can have joy while you're suffering. But he says here, is anyone cheerful? And cheerful simply means, uh, it refers to someone being happy or being not worried or being at peace. So he says, if you're cheerful, then praise God. If you're cheerful, cheerful in the midst of suffering, then praise God. Sing to Him. Tell of, of His goodness. And, and these two situations together, though, if anyone's suffering, if anyone's cheerful, these two situations together suggest, though, that whatever your situation, what should you do? Well, you should talk to God. Whatever your situation, talk to God. Whether it's good or whether it's bad, talk to God. Everything should direct you to God. Talk to Him. He continues, verse 14. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Now, let's just stop there for a minute. So he comes now with a third rhetorical question and with direction for what to do in this situation. And the answer is still prayer. But it's a little different. And it's a little more involved. So he says, is anyone sick? And when he's asked this question, he's talking about a physical illness. And he says, so if, if you're sick, what do you do? Well, you ask the elders to come and pray for him. And then when the elders pray for the person, it says that, that prayer of faith will save him. Now, on one hand, this seems very, uh, pretty simple, pretty straightforward. But on the other hand, several questions immediately arise when we read this. And so let me just deal with the questions. First of all, what's the deal with oil? Well, 
Why does he say anoint with oil? Why would we anoint with oil? The funny thing is, is this is actually a very minor part of the passage, but it gets a lot of attention. And so I'm just going to deal with it right off the bat. So uh, anointing with oil is spoken of a lot in the Old Testament. Uh, and it's often a symbol of something in the Old Testament. So a symbol of either like the Holy Spirit empowering a person to do a specific ministry or a symbol of, of a person being set apart to God to be used in a specific ministry or both. A lot of times it was referring to both of those things. For example, like priests, they would be consecrated, they would set apart, they would be anointed with oil to do the service, and also God was empowering them to do their service. And so we have this as a symbol. Now in the New Testament, anointing with oil isn't very common. So why would we anoint the sick? Well, some have suggested it's because it's like medicine. Uh, you know, for medicinal purposes. Um, but it's not. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just be straight. It's not. It's a symbol of consecration, just like we were talking about in the Old Testament. Uh, it, why would I say that? Well, James makes no allusion to the oil having any healing power. But he clearly says that a person is healed through what? Through the prayer of faith. Okay, but also, if it was medicine, it would make sense that uh, it wouldn't make sense that you would be calling the elders, the spiritual leaders of the church, to come and administer it, because anyone could put the oil on the person, and if they're sick enough that you're calling the elders to come out to their house, you would assume someone already had or would have. If you needed medicine, you would just take the medicine. But also, quite simply, because the most common use of oil in the Bible is symbolic. Like those in the Old Testament who were set apart to God for a specific ministry. So this anointing with oil is done by the elders and done as they pray. It's symbolic of the person being set apart for God's special attention, for God's special care. So it's a symbol asking God to pay special attention to them. That's why they anoint with oil. Second question. Are all sick people healed when we pray for them? What's the answer? No. But it sounds like James is giving us an unconditional promise here. So why are not all people healed? Well, I'm just going to tell you, first of all, it's not an unconditional promise. It, James is giving us a general principle here, although he is stating it very strongly. But he is stating it strongly with the understanding that it all depends on God and God's will. If you remember earlier, when he was talking about making plans, he said, he said that, uh, you know, the, the people say, well, today or tomorrow, tomorrow I'm going to go to this town and I'm going to make money. And he said, don't say that. What did he say? He said, you should say, if God wills, I will live and do these things. And we, we talked about that. And we said, notice that he says, if God wills, I will live and do these things. Even if we live depends on God's will. If I will be alive tomorrow depends on God's will. And so this is an ingrained thought in James's head. This is the way he thinks. It's just understood that it is if it depends that everything depends on God's will. And so it's stated with that understanding that it ultimately depends on God's will. And so But it sounds like a promise, an unconditional promise. And some people have tried to avoid uh, that apparent problem by saying that he's not talking about physical sickness, but he's talking about someone being like spiritually weak. And, uh, but this doesn't seem right to me either. Uh, when we read this paragraph, it, it just, the most natural way to take it is that he's talking about someone being sick. Physically sick. That's just the most natural way that you just read it. This way, and when you read it, that's just how you, you see it. 
But people come along and they spiritualize this. But there's no clear reason to do that, to take it to mean being spiritually frail. Now, later he does talk about sickness and sin, but we'll talk about that in a minute. And also, the word sick here can simply mean weakness, but it's regularly used for physical illness. So we're talking about an actual physical illness here. So now we go back to the question, are all healed? Well, James tells us that the key to being healed is the prayer of faith. He says that the prayer of faith will save him. And remember earlier in his letter, when James was talking about asking for wisdom, he says but that if someone is going to ask or expects to receive anything from God, he has to pray in faith without wavering. So, faith is required. However, this raises another question. Does this mean that if a sick person is not healed, that there was unbelief involved? And the answer is, well, it's possible, but it's not necessarily the case. Uh, it may simply be that it's just not God's will. It's not what God has deemed to be best. And, and we need to be careful with this, um, this way of thinking, the, 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 this, when we talk about belief and unbelief and faith and people being healed. Because some people have been told that they were not healed because they didn't have enough faith, or that their faith wasn't strong enough, or that they just lacked faith. Then the person is suffering both under physical sickness and the feelings of failure that they didn't have the right kind of faith that they didn't believe or that their faith is just weak. And some have even then doubted God and doubted their salvation because of it. And that's not what James is saying here. And one of the things, if we're going to, if someone is saying, well, someone's not healed, it's because they didn't have faith. Notice who's doing the prayer in here. Who's the person who's praying in faith? The elders not the sick person. It's the elders here. And now, the thing is, is we may not know the reason uh, that a person is not healed. But you don't go blaming the sick person for not being healed because they had a lack of faith. Now, I'm not suggesting that we should go and blame the elders either. Rather, we need to try and understand what the prayer of faith is. See, praying in faith doesn't simply mean, if I believe enough, I will get what I want. That's not the prayer of faith. It means that you believe in God, that you trust in God, and you are praying according to His will. Remember the Apostle Paul? Uh, remember he had some physical ailment, some kind of physical problem, and he asked God to take it away. And what did God say? No. <laughs> he said, well, let me just read it for you. Uh, 2 Corinthians 12, verses 7 and 9. He says, So, to keep me from becoming conceited because, it, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, in other words, God has done such great things through Paul, he said, God did this to keep me from conceited. There was a reason for it. But he says, A thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should, be, that it should leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast more gladly in all my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. God says, no, I'm not taking it away, but I'll take care of you. I'm not going to take that away, but you'll be okay. And Paul says, okay, I'm good with that. You see, it wasn't God's will for him to be healed. And then there, there's another interesting thing. One of Paul's uh, traveling companions wasn't healed. Now, here, the, the interesting thing about this is Paul 
he performed miracles all the time. I mean, we have, we have the, the, the accounts written down for us of miracles he performed. And yet here's one of his ministry partners, a traveling companion that wasn't healed. In 2 Timothy 4.20, he says, Erastus remained at Corinth, and I left Trophimus, who was ill, at Miletus. You see, not everyone is healed, even when there's faith. You see, because we wouldn't accuse Paul of not having faith, would we? So not everyone is healed even when there is faith. But I want you also to notice in, in these situations, in both these cases, there's no complaining about it either. Just a simple recognition that this is the will of God. That is faith. When we trust God, we believe in God, and we say, okay, if that's your will, I'll live with it. And I'll continue trusting. And so the prayer of faith is undivided, persistent prayer that recognizes that God is sovereign and that His will is supreme. And sometimes we don't know what God's will is. But in faith, we believe in God and we trust Him and we submit to His will. That's faith. And if someone is sick and in need of healing, we know that we need God. And so we pray to Him and we pray with that same faith, believing that He can heal and trusting that God will do what is best. And just one other little side note. But an important side note. It's not the prayer or your faith that actually heals. It's God who heals. But God wants us to come to Him and to pray in faith. You see, the prayer, our faith, is, is the vehicle that God uses to bring the healing. But God does the healing. We seek God. We seek God in prayer, and then He heals. Well, let's move to the third question. Then. What is the relationship between sin and sickness? Well, it could be related, or it could be not related at all. Except for the fact that sickness is part of our fallen condition, sinful condition. When sin came to the world, so did sickness and physical weakness and death. And so it's not like a one-to-one, -one, like if you're sick, that means you must have sinned. Uh, but it's possible. Uh, in Jewish thought, oftentimes sickness and physical ailments like being blind or crippled uh, were assumed to be the result of sin. We know the stories of Jesus when, when Jesus' disciples were walking by and say, Hey, Jesus, why was this guy born blind? Was it because of his sin or his, his parents' sin? And Jesus said, Well, neither. But that's another story. But that was the way they thought. Well, if someone had this problem, it, it must have been some result of sin. And really what that was, it was an over-application of God's promises of blessings and cursings. You know, when God said to Israel, if, if you obey me, I will bless you, and if you disobey me, I will curse you. Well, they over-applied that idea to say, okay, anytime someone is sick, well, they must be in sin. But James is not following that same line of thinking as, as, as the Jews did there. But he does allow for the possibility that the sickness was brought on by sin. He says, if there is sin in the, in the person's life. And so he's given that possibility. So if you know that there is sin in your life, he's saying you, you've got to confess it. 
You've got to get right with God. So that may or may not be the cause of your sickness because that, that, that sickness, uh, it may be the cause. The sickness may be disciplined from God. Or it may not be, but you still need to get right with God. And then, after you've confessed your sins, the prayer of faith can save you. One more question. Do we have to confess all our sins to each other? Because you caught that right where you said that. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for one another. Do we need to confess all our sins to each other? Well, in context here, it may be referring specifically to sins that we think may have brought on a sickness. Or he may be speaking generally of just offenses against others in the church community. Because you'll notice that he shifted from talking about a specific sick individual and the elders coming and praying for him to now talking about everyone in the church praying and being healed. And so we are a community connected through Christ. And we need to confess to each other when we sin against each other. So if I do something specifically to hurt you, I need to confess that and get right. And we need to pray for each other. And speaking of everyone praying for each other, he continues on. Look at the, the, the last part of verse 16. He says, the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. So he just told us all to pray for each other. And now he tells us that prayer works. Why should we do it? Because it works. He says it's effective and it has great power. Again, not that prayer itself heals, but it's the, the, how, the way we connect with the Almighty God. The way we seek His help. And God responds to prayer. But there's a qualification here. James says, the prayer of a righteous person is effective. So who's a righteous person? We talked about this earlier in the book as well. But a righteous person is someone who is in a right relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And, and is faithful and obedient to God. James spoke earlier about the person with true faith and how his faith is, is demonstrated through obedience, through works. And here when he mentions the righteous person, he's talking about that same person. So the obedient person of faith wields the mighty weapon of prayer. And he gives Elijah as an example here. And so, in case you don't know, Elijah was living at a time when the king of Israel was, uh, was uh, well, evil. <laughs> and he was worshiping the false god Baal. And many of the Israelites were following in the same, uh, same ways of uh, worshiping the false god Baal. And at that time, James says that, that Elijah prayed that it would stop raining and it didn't rain. The Old Testament doesn't tell us that Elijah prayed for it not to rain. It simply tells us that God told Elijah, go tell Ahab it's not going to rain. And so you could assume then that Elijah told him and then prayed that it would stop raining. But, but James is saying here that he prayed and then it stopped raining. But there was famine for three and a half years. And this three and a half years of famine was basically judgment upon their sin, upon their idolatry. As God had promised, if you obey me, I will bless you. If you disobey me, I will curse you. And one of the big, big things that they were not supposed to do was worship other gods. Remember, thou shalt not have any other gods before me. And so this judgment, this famine was judgment on their idolatry. 
So for three and a half years, it did not rain. And then at the end of that time, uh, Elijah challenged the prophets to Baal uh, and, and, and to a competition. You know, where they put out the, 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 the altar and, and put the animals on it and poured water on it and asked it to uh, ask God or their God to light it on fire. Long story short, God won. <laughs> All right? Elijah prayed to God and God lit that altar on fire after the prophets of Baal failed to do so. It proved who was the true God. And then following that competition, Elijah went and prayed that it would rain. And we have that recorded for us, that he prayed for rain. But when he prayed for rain, it rained. And when we read that, we think, wow, Elijah, He's in a category all his own. He is, we're amazed at it. Say, he must be in a category all his own. And James says, nope. James says, no. And that's his point here. Elijah is human, was human, just like us. That means that we can pray just like him. But there's one other thing I want you to notice about Elijah and his prayer. It wasn't just a simple, real quick, one time, oh, God, do this. In fact, let me read for you. In 1 Kings 18, 42, it says, He bowed himself down on the earth and put his face between his knees. This is picturing him. He is praying hard. And it goes on to say that he prayed, for, he prayed seven times before a small little cloud appeared on the horizon. And so he prayed hard. He prayed seven times. He was, Elijah wasn't superhuman. He just believed in God. And he trusted God. And he was obedient to God. And he prayed to an all-powerful God. And so this powerful prayer of a righteous person that James is writing about is a sincere, persistent, wholehearted prayer. And it can be done by any believer in Jesus. We have the same God. And we can pray like Elijah. Now, there's a whole lot about these verses that we could continue to talk about, but the overall point is quite simple. Pray. James says, pray. Talk to God. So he said, tell the truth. He's told us to pray for each other. And now he has one final instruction to watch out for each other. Verses 19 and 20 says, My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. So he tells us here to watch out for each other, specifically for others' uh, spiritual well-being. And he's talking to believers here because he addresses them as brothers again. But who is he talking about? When he's talking about this sinner who wanders away, who is he talking about? Well, he says, if anyone among you, and so this could refer to a, a true believer, or it could refer to someone who has not yet believed in Jesus, but has outwardly identified himself with the community of believers. In other words, someone who comes to church, someone who takes part in, community, in the community of the church, but hasn't believed in Jesus. So it could be either situation. But he says, if anyone wanders from the truth, anyone among you wanders from the truth, that is from the, the gospel specifically or, and the truth of God in general. So the teaching of the scripture on doctrine and on practice, if anyone wanders from that, we are to call them back. So someone, whether is, he, he is a true believer or not, may, may wander away. But if they do, we don't just stand back and ignore it. So, yeah, no big deal. 
No, we, we try to turn them from sin and to Jesus. And James says, if they come back, you have saved his soul from death. And when he says this, he's talking about eternal salvation uh, from spiritual death and judgment. And this sounds, this sounds a little odd if we were talking about a believer who has wandered. But it wouldn't make perfect sense if we were talking about a person who was just in the church but wasn't a believer yet. But here's the thing. We don't know people's hearts. And so we don't know, we don't always know what their spiritual condition actually is. Back in chapter 2, he suggested that true faith is lived out and demonstrated by works. And so if a person walks away from the faith, that might leave the question in James's mind, do they have faith? And that isn't to judge their salvation, but simply to show the importance of turning them back. Because you may actually be bringing that person to saving faith. But in either case, it will bring forgiveness from God. When a person turns back to faithfully following Jesus... His sins are covered. God forgives him. And, and so the challenge here, some of these things may not be clear, but the challenge is clear. Believers are to watch out for the spiritual well-being of others in the church. We are to challenge each other. We are to correct each other. We are to encourage each other in the faith and to live out our faith. And so James tells us, be honest. He tells us, pray. And he tells us, watch out for each other. And this is a fitting conclusion to all that James has written. And it's a summary challenge to live out what he's taught in this letter. So be obedient and help others to be obedient. Draw near to God and help others draw near to God. Be doers of the word and help others be doers of the word. Live in view of eternity and help others live in view of eternity. Tell each other the truth. Pray for each other and challenge and correct and encourage each other. That's the life of faith. And faith works.